what so we are live now now we can start good morning everyone uh, today we are going to talk sir is going to talk on management of supracondylar fractures so sandeep vaidya sir and sandeep patwardhan sir will be talking on reduction techniques of supracondylar fractures so i'll briefly introduce both the sirs so uh, are you able to see my screen sir yes yes sir so we have dr sandeep vaidya sir who is a consultant orthopedic surgeon at bj wadia hospital sir has done his ms ortho from st gs medical college and km hospital in mumbai and mrcs sir uh, has done his fellowships from korea university medical center national university hospital and children's hospital of philadelphia He is an avid academic academician and is and has been invited as faculty at various conferences, workshops, and symposia both at national and international level. He has more more than ten publications in various national and international peer-reviewed journals. Thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation today. And the next speaker is Dr. Sandeep Patwardhan, sir. He is a HOD at Sancheti Hospital, Pune. and he is also a visiting orthopedic specialist at jahangir hospital and bharati vidyapeeth medical college so has done his ms ortho from seon hospital mumbai and various fellowships in traumatology from germany and fellowship in pediatric orthopedics from national university of health singapore he has been faculty for uh, at various conferences national state and international levels and he has conducted various scans for cerebral palsy and polio at in various parts of the country so thank you so much sir for accepting our invitation today and we'll start with sandeep vaid's uh, talk first so about sir, sandeep i would like to add two things one is uh, sandeep has a beautiful center pinnacle ortho care in navi mumbai and he has contributed a nice textbook of uh, pediatric orthopedic trauma so i urge all the fellows to go through that along with dr mandar agash and binoti shet uh, this is a wonderful book and a ready reckoner for all the pediatric orthopedic fellows yes sandeep all all yours now yeah thanks molin for inviting me here uh, thanks dr godasiri for the kind introduction I'll just okay. So I hope I'm visible. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. So uh, my first talk today is, uh, uh, you know, actually it is regarding the technique for close reduction and pending of a supracondylar humerus fracture. But uh, uh, let us before jumping into that let us first understand what exactly i mean by the term typical supracondylar fracture so firstly with respect to the direction of displacement we all know that majority of the supracondylar fractures uh, they are of the extension type that is the uh, uh, the distal fragment displaces posteriorly so the typical supracondylar fracture is an extension type of fracture the flexion type is extremely rare only about 2% of supracondylar fractures are flexion type uh again with respect to the uh, you know pattern of uh, fracture pattern so uh, the bark classification we are all aware of and in bark classification the typical fracture is one in which the fracture is at the level of the uh, of the olecranon fossa number 1 and number 2 the pattern of the fracture it is uh, transverse in both the sagittal and oblique planes so that is a typical fracture on the other hand oblique fractures high fractures and low fractures they all fall under the category of atypical fractures so to summarize a typical fracture is an extension type of fracture at the level of the olecranon fossa and transverse in both coronal and sagittal planes and here i would like to add one more point where the surrounding soft tissue envelope is reasonably intact so it is a after reduction it is a reasonably stable fracture so with that overview i will uh, now come to the treatment of supracondylar uh, humerus fractures so not all fractures we know need close reduction and k wire pinning uh, some fractures like the type 1 fractures and uh, 
tight to a fractures where the fracture line is passing through the capitulum the anterior humeral line is passing through the capitulum these can effectively be treated with a cast in situ on the other hand type 1 fractures with medial column combination or type 2 a fractures where the angulation is more severe and the anterior humeral line is passing anterior to the capitulum type 2b fractures where there is rotation in addition to angulation and obviously type 3 fractures these all uh, here all the uh, the standard of care is close reduction k wire pinning and cast application so let's now come to the technique per se the first uh, most important part of the uh, uh, of the surgery is the patient positioning and uh, here the surgeon has to be uh, absolutely sure that he is completely comfortable with the patient positioning uh, there are various options available uh, in the olden days uh, you know many surgeons they used to prefer to keep the arm on the uh, uh, receiver of the image intensifier itself however there are quite a few studies which have come of uh, come out of late which show that the radiation to the surgeon with this positioning is almost twice that of the standard positioning and therefore you know many surgeons they don't prefer this sort of a positioning uh, the second option the, the picture that you can see in the middle that is my preference for the older child where the child is supine on the fracture table and a, a arm uh, the is extended on the side arm table on the other hand in the smaller child what i do as you can see in option number 3 is i push the child to the edge of the table and the cm comes from the opposite side so uh, the radial lucent part of the table uh, the elbow is uh, lies on that and so we get a very clear cm picture so these are a few options additionally uh, sandeep is going to, uh, patwadhan is going to talk about this uh, his arm boat technique and this is also an elegant technique uh, with this technique you can uh, do without an assistant so he is going to talk about that in detail so once we have done the positioning then uh, then comes the uh, reduction maneuver the patient is uh, painted prepared and day and in the reduction the first step of the reduction is applying traction and disimpacting the fracture fragments so the assistant he applies counter traction at the level of the upper arm and the surgeon he holds the uh, forearm at the wrist in the supinated position and applies traction and under c arm you confirm that the fracture fragments are disimpacted the next step is correction of coronal uh, displacement so uh, that is done again under image intensifier and then the third most important step is correction of the subjective displacement for here here the uh, surgeon places his uh, four fingers on the uh, proximal fragment on the volar aspect of the proximal fragment the thumb lies on the olecranon and while maintaining the traction the elbow is flexed uh, completely now if you are able to flex the elbow completely that itself is an indication that probably your reduction is successful on the other hand if there is a restriction of flexion it probably means that you uh, you have not been successful in reducing the fracture so even before you know getting your lateral view you can see whether you are this gives you a rough idea whether your reduction is good the last step is locking of the reduction and this depends on your initial fracture displacement so for a fracture with posterior medial displacement you pronate the forearm for fracture with posterior lateral displacement you supine the forearm by doing so what happens is that the intact periosteum it tightens and it kind of locks the fracture fragments in the uh, reduced position now once the reduction maneuver is done we have to be sure that your alignment is good and for that you acquire uh, uh, the ap orientation you see by obtaining the jones view and here you calculate the bobbins angle the normal range of which is 70 to 75 degrees uh, any bobbins angle which is less than this uh, which is more than this probably indicates that it is a cubitus varus and that should not be accepted also you have to obtain oblique views and look at the continuity of the pillars and finally to get the lateral view if you don't want to turn the cm what i do is rotate the arm at the level of the shoulder don't apply st any stress to the uh, level uh, to the elbow rotate the sh uh, uh, shoulder uh, externally so that you get a clear cut lateral view and you can confirm that your reduction once your reduction is obtained then uh, you have to pin the fracture and uh, the standard uh, wire configuration that is used for the typical fracture 
are the lateral pins. Okay, so there are only lateral pins suffice if your fracture pattern is typical. Uh, you can insert either two or three wires depending upon your fracture stability. Now, out of these three wires, the inner wire, that is the uh, the medial wire out of these three wires, it has a four cortex hole. So it enters the capitulum, comes out to the uh, olecranon fossa, again re enters the cortex of the olecranon fossa, and then takes the cortex of the distal medial humerus. So it's a four cortex wire, it's extremely stable. The outer uh, wire is the pillar wire, right? So uh, uh, the first one is a, goes through the olecranon fossa, the outer is a pillar wire. Additionally, there should be divergence between these two wires, and there should be a good spread in between the two wires and the level of the fracture. So these are the criteria of a good pinning configuration. In the satellite plane, your pin configuration should be slightly anterior to posterior because that gives a good hold to your uh, uh, through your ossified portion of your capitulum. If at the end of these two wires your fracture is still unstable, then you can insert one more additional wire in between these two wires. In case of atypical fractures, you may need to slightly modify your wiring configuration. So if it is a medial oblique fracture, you will need to put medial pins. High transverse fractures, you would need to put intramedullary wires. And in satellite oblique fractures, you will need to put posterior to anterior wires. Now, uh, this slide I could have inserted in the next presentation rather than here. Medial pins are almost never needed in case of typical fractures. But anyways, how to if they are ever needed, then how to insert them safely? So there are a few rules that you have to follow. Firstly, always put your medial wire after insertion of your lateral wire. So this allows some amount of elbow extension and your ulnar nerve then falls posteriorly, which makes your medial wire safe. Second point, take a stab incision. So under image intensifier control, take a stab incision at the level of your medial epicondyle and then with the mosquito forceps, dissect through the stab incision right down to the bone so that there is no soft tissue entrap uh, uh, below your incision. Third point, while inserting the wire, always use a drill sleeve. The most common mechanism of injury to the ulnar nerve is that while spinning of the K wire, the nerve can get entangled or the nerve sheath can get entangled in the wire. And therefore, in order to avoid that, it is important that you use a drill sleeve while inserting a medial wire. And finally, most important, your wire trajectory should always be slight anterior to the posterior in order to avoid uh, posterior slippage and damage to the ulnar nerve. So these four simple rules you can follow to minimize injury to the medial wire. Uh, Postoperatively, my protocol is I apply a cast. I don't apply a slab. I apply a cast. But I pre uh, create a window within the cast through which I do a weekly dressing of KY tracks to the cast window. Cast and wire removal is performed at four weeks following which I mobilize the child. I don't give any uh, specific physiotherapy, but I just allow regular mobilization. Uh, only in cases where the edema is significant and I am a bit uh, worried about the possibility of impending compartment syndrome, I may apply a slab and then maybe change to a cast at one week. So that was about uh, typical fractures. Uh, Molin, you take any questions now or shall we do that later? Yeah, so uh, let's talk about this basic supracondylar. Let's take a few questions and then we'll move on. So, any question, uh, Goda? No, sir. We have no questions in the chat box. Yeah. So, uh, Sandeep, would you emphasize the measuring the pulsation while you do the reduction? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so and, that is... and what, what uh, if while doing a reduction you feel that the pulse is gone? What would you do? So uh, that is a very rare uh, situation, you know. So. Before, obviously, you know, any supracondylar, I didn't cover that, sorry about that. But any supracondylar, when he comes in preoperatively, you must make sure that the pulse is there. If the pulse is not there, then that becomes a pink pulseless hand. And in that case, your, you know, protocols, they change. Uh, so uh, you are talking about the scenario where a pulse disappears after yeah. pinning. Is that what you're talking about? Right. So yeah. again, you yeah. know, so... If a pulse was present before reduction and it disappears after reduction, then, you know, first of all, though, I would put the arm in complete extension and uh, just wait for some time, wait it out for some time and see whether the pulse is returning. 
I would apply the pulse ox, see what are the waveforms. Uh, but you know, at at the end of a reasonable uh, time period, maybe five minutes or so, five to ten minutes, if the pulse does not return, then I would straight away, you know, open my wires and you know, release my reduction and then see what is what is going on. Because now this is a different situation from you know where you are pinning a pink pulseless hand in the first place. You had a pulse to start with and then disappears, so that becomes a different scenario. So here I would be really worried and would take things very cautiously. Yeah, that's that's right. Thank you, Sandeep. So we have one more question, sir, from Dr. Gaurav, sir. Uh, the question is: Sometimes we don't get absolute anatomical reduction even after multiple attempts, but clinical alignment and range is normal. So, what should be done in those cases? Should we accept or should we open open the fracture? Yeah. So, uh, your point is very correct. If the alignment is good. Clinically, your cosmetically, you are seeing that your alignment is good, and also your range is full. Yeah, exactly. Then the main thing that I would be looking at is the mal rotation. If the rotation is significant, then probably I would try to reduce the fracture. Mm -hmm. That means that a significant mal rotation it predisposes to later loss of reduction and collapse into virus. So I wouldn't accept too much amount of uh, you know mal rotation. I would try to reduce this fracture. But uh, if there is some amount of angulation, like you know, you are in the sagittal plane, your fracture is not completely aligned, but still your anterior humeral line is going through the capitulum, and clinically on the table, you have a full flexion range, then I wouldn't really fret too much about that. I would accept that kind of a reduction. So rotation is something, however, I would watch out for because with rotation, what can happen is you can have a good alignment on the table, but later on, that being an unstable fracture pattern. You may lose your reduction later on, so that is something I would try to reduce and improve my alignment. So, Sunday, the next talk point... I'm going to try try to talk about few maneuvers that you can do yeah. in order to improve your you know rotational uh, deformity. Yeah, yeah. So, this one point is we usually check uh, the hello alignment. Just yeah, can you hear me, Sandeep? Yeah. Hello. Okay. Yeah, so usually, usually we check the lateral alignment in external rotation, but we must check also in internal rotation, which, which is the position of immobilization. And then sometimes we see this anterior spike, and I, I think you will talk about it in your uh, next talk. Sir so, Goda, we can take another question. Yes, sir. Two more questions. One from Dr. Meet Jane. Uh, if after lateral pinning, the lateral view with shoulder and external rotation and that with shoulder and internal rotation is different, they what should be question. done? I think we discussed this in last iFix as well. I would accept it. Why because you, you see, um, why you <laughs> we, we discussed this point in uh, just last iFix. So you see, actually, you know, after your pinning, if in external rotation, you know, to see the sagittal, uh, I mean, lateral view externally rotate, uh, if it is good in that view, then uh, I would accept that because practically you are then going to, you know, immobilize your uh, your fracture in in a cast. And there is no possibility of that, again, you know, producing, uh, I mean, uh, loss of reduction within the cast. So I wouldn't really, you know, worry too much about that. It almost always happens in supracondyla that your reduction looks, you know, perfect on table. But when you do a post-op X-ray, there is some amount of you know uh, malalignment, but practically that doesn't cause any clinical uh, difference. Yeah, Sandeep wants to come in. I think we discussed this in last iFix. So the comment I yes, make, the comment I wanted to make is that see your X-ray technician is not oriented. So how to take the X-ray? You will just write post-op X-ray API lateral, and the easiest way for him is to rotate from the humerus to take the lateral. He's so your best information is always on table in operation. Okay, your post op is completely unacceptable. Every time you do a perfect supracondylar thinning, your post op will be because of the way it is. Hello? Yes, sir. Am I, yeah. am I, am I audible? Perfect. So, so if it's good on table, it's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your end of your career. Completely agree. Should, should be confident. Things are high, but you can't hold it. That's it. Don't read too much. 
You are breaking. Your voice yeah. is breaking. Something wrong. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, better. Yes. This is better. Okay. Oh. Okay, I was just saying that if after your filling you have a clinical practice alignment, good stable functional pins, pins, and uh, both filler and post pins, you shouldn't be worried too much about what post op X ray looks like. We are not here to treat X rays, we are here to treat patients. So just look at your alignment and your range of motion and uh, stability. So maybe you can take a just floor view and just flex extend it. Confirm that it is stable. If it is that fine, then you can you know, leave it at that. Yes, sir. So one last question from Dr. Sujit. Any tips if for rotational alignment, rotational malalignment? Any test? Tips, tips for managing rotational yeah, yeah, I'm coming to that in the next one. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, Sandeep, you can proceed to your next talk. Okay, so uh, yeah, my second assignment today was to talk about you know the fracture with multidirectional instability. So first, you know, let's talk about what are the problematic fractures. We just spoke about you know the typical fractures. So the problem supracondylars, as I see, you know, they are of two types. One is irreducible, where you know the reduction is either difficult or they are not reducible at all, and uh, uh, this can be due to soft tissue interposition or other factors. And uh, so that is one category. The other category of problem fractures are those which are unstable, where the reduction is not necessarily that difficult. You may get the reduction, but then they are so unstable that holding that reduction while you pass the wires becomes very difficult. They can either, you know, displace, they mal rotate, all these things happen. And uh, my brief today is mainly to talk about the unstable fractures. I think irreducible uh, Sandeep is going to talk in the next talk. So I will stick to the unstable fractures because there are slightly different maneuvers which you use in irreducible as against unstable. Now, which are the unstable fractures typically? So the first one that is unstable is the fracture with multidirectional instability and uh, which was uh, which was labeled as Gartland type 4 in a JBJS paper by Leitch in 2006. So that is one category. The second type of unstable fractures are the flexion type fractures. Again, extremely rare fractures, constitute only about 2% of all supramontalar fractures. Then occasionally even fractures which are posturolatively displaced and which are comminuted, they can, they, are notor they can sometimes be notoriously unstable. That is, you obtain a reduction, but you know, rotationally they remain very unstable and it be becomes very difficult to pin these fractures. So I would, you know, group all these three factors under the uh, heading of unstable supracondylar factors. And uh, the maneuvers that you use for all three of them can be, you know, you can use the same maneuvers. Now, whatever be the mechanism of instability, what is common in all these fractures uh, is that there is a severe damage to the surrounding soft tissue envelope. So there is a torn periosteum. And these fractures are unstable inflection and stroke or rotation and therefore pinning is technically difficult for this time. Okay. So what is the solution? You know, this is the problem. How do you, what is the solution? So there are, you know, a few tips and tricks which have been described in literature. Number one is you can obtain a better control of your distal fragment by inserting the joystick wire into the distal fragment. So that is one uh, option you have. Second option that has been described is insertion of a provisional trans polycrinone K wire in order to stabilize the fracture provisionally in the and uh, till you insert your definitive wires. And the third option is to obtain better control of your proximal fragment uh, by inserting a proximal fragment joystick wire. This is especially useful in cases where there is rotational instability. So let's just see these you know, uh, techniques one by one. So the joystick wire uh, uh, control of the distal fragment, it has been described in various papers after uh, you know, the first description of uh, type 4 fracture by uh, Leitch in 2006. And I'm just quoting one of these papers. It was a JPO paper in 2013, which uh, described this uh, technique. So I will just take you through the steps of this uh, uh, technique. 
So this is an illustration from the same paper. I don't have any personal experience with this technique. So this is again a fracture with multidirectional instability. As you can see, there is a cross rotational instability. So the first step over here is that the assistant with one hand, he holds the proximal arm and with the other hand, he holds the wrist and flexes the elbow to 90 degree flexion. Following this, the C arm is rotated in order to obtain an exact you know, lateral profile of the distal fragment. So the initial focus is solely on the distal fragment. Once this view is obtained, a 2 mm K wire is inserted into the distal fragment in the mid sagittal plane. Then the C arm is rotated and again, you confirm that this wire is in a reasonably okay uh, position in the AP view as well. Following this, uh, the uh, surgeon now has control with the on the distal fragment and by moving the joystick wire, he can correct the coronal sagittal alignment as well as the rotational alignment of the distal fragment. Additionally, the assistant rotates the proximal arm in order to align the proximal fragment with the distal fragment. And once a reasonable alignment is obtained, the wire which was initially inserted, the joystick wire, it is then inserted across the fracture and to obtain fixation. Once the initial fixation is obtained, additional wires are inserted to obtain stability. So this was the joystick technique which has been described and uh, it can be useful in multidirectional fractures. Another technique which has been described is uh, use of the provisional trans olefinone pin. And uh, this was described in 2017. And this was described primarily for flexion type supracondylar humerus fractures. But this can also be done for multidirectional uh, unstable fractures. So this was a 10 year old girl who presented to us with a flexion type supracondylar humerus fracture. Now, the first step in treatment or, uh, is close reduction. So how do you close reduce a flexion type supracondylar fracture? So here there are maneuvers which have been described. And what you have to do is uh, compression uh, or longitudinal force along the long axis of the forearm. So you uh, push the flex distal fragment back into alignment with respect to the proximal fragment. Once that alignment is obtained, then what you do is you insert your provisional trans olecranon K wire. So this K wire, it goes from the olecranon, it transfixes the elbow joint, then holds the distal fragment and then goes into the medullary cavity of the proximal fragment. So with this, now what this wire achieves, the CM is again rotated into the uh, intramedullary position of the wire in the proximal fragment, it is confirmed. Now what this wire achieves is it gives you uh, uh, it prevents gross displacement of the fracture in either the coronal or sagittal plane. At the same time, it allows a bit of a play to correct any residual varus valgus or sagittal plane angulation because remember that in the proximal fragment, the wire is still intramedullary and therefore it can still toggle a bit. Therefore, you can still get some reduction even after inserting this wire. Once this is done, then you insert your definitive wire. So this is your definitive fixation your lateral wire, and then additional wires are inserted, after which your provi uh, provisional trans olecranon wire, which was inserted, that can be. So this is another uh, tip that can be used in order to uh, you know, reduce and fix the highly unstable fractures. The last uh, technique that I want to show you is the use uh, of the proximal fragment joystick wire. And so here you take control of the proximal fragment. And this is especially useful if you have a uh, rotational instability at the fracture site. So this is an illustration from the paper. So what you do over here is you insert a wire into your proximal fragment and this wire, then you rotate and derotate till perfect alignment is obtained rotationally. Uh, and then once you get the, uh, the good alignment, then you can insert your definitive fixation wires. So this is a technique which can be used. Uh, this is a video illustration and uh, Venkat from uh, Ganga Hospital has uh, contributed this case. So see over here. So this is a very gross, uh, you know, rotational malalignment, as you can see. So then what you do is you insert a wire in the proximal fragment. And once you insert that wire, you rotate your proximal fragment by joysticking this wire. And then you get the correct alignment. And then you fix it with your definitive K wires. And this is how you can achieve a good alignment. 
So I think this is a pretty good technique in order to uh, obtain good rotational mal alignment because uh, rotation can sometimes be uh, tricky. Now this technique can also be combined with either of the first two techniques. So you will get control of the proximal fragment as well as distal fragment. So these are some of the you know tips and tricks which you can use in order to you know uh, 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 treat unstable fractures. So the first step over here is you have to identify which are the unstable fractures. And then once that is done, then you can judiciously use either of these tricks in order to uh, treat them by close reduction and KYR pinning. So uh, that's all from my end. So Sandeep, what is your uh, indication and rate of open reduction? And if required, uh, which approach you use? Can you guide people about it? So, Open reduction generally, uh, it is for irreducible fractures. As I said, you know, I, I thought that was not the uh, in the you know in the purview of my topic today, so I didn't cover that. But irreducible is a different issue, you know, where you don't get a reduction at all. You try to reduce it by close means, but you know, either because there is some soft tissue interposition, or uh, you know, uh, there is a uh, you know button holding which is not getting reduced by your milking maneuver. So those would be my indications for open reduction. Additionally, you know, uh, one category where I would have a very low threshold for uh, open reduction is uh, pink pulseless and pink pulseless in association with AIM palsy. Because here, uh, you know, if I don't get an easy close reduction, uh, there is a high possibility that there may be entrapment of the neurovascular bundle. And therefore, in these cases, uh, I would... Uh, uh, go ahead with open reduction. I have a very low threshold for open reduction. But even before going for open reduction in the irreducible fractures, which are not complicated by neurovascular involvement, I would try a intrafocal, you know, reduction by inserting a wire, uh, you know, intrafocally and then reducing the fracture. So I would try that first and that fails and I would go for open reduction. Regarding your question of approach, so that approach depends on the direction of displacement. So if it is a postural laterally displaced fracture, then you are the spike of my proximal fragment would lie anteromedially and my incision would be right on that on that spike. Because that is where you know the fragment has buttonholed through the rent in the brachialis. On the other hand, if it is a posterior medially displaced frag uh, fragment, then uh, the spike of my proximal fragment uh, will be anterolaterally, and that is where my incision would be. So that depends, you know, it has, the call has to be taken depending on the direction of displacement, the position of your bruise, all these things have to be taken. Yeah, thank, thanks, Sandeep. Goda, any questions? Uh, we have no questions, sir. So, okay, so we can move on to Dr. Yes, Sandeep Patwardhan's talk. Yes, sir. Thank you, Sandeep Vaidya, sir. Sandeep Patwardhan, sir, can you please share your screen, sir? Hi, good morning, Nandi and other people. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. So, okay, so there may be some audio issues. I don't think there is, think there is a compatibility issue with my earphone and the computer. So if you don't hear something, tell me, I will repeat it. Am I audible? You're clear now, sir. Clear, no? Okay. So, good morning. Um, so, your voice is breaking, sir? Yeah, exactly. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Now it's clear. Okay. Is this better? Yes, sir. The screen is visible. No, no. Is am I audible? Right, sir. You're audible, sir. Can you see the screen? Yes, sir. All right. So, Maulin, good morning, and thank you for inviting me to this academic uh, fellows round on supracondylar fractures. And I was hearing um, Sandeep Vaidya talking uh, with great interest uh, regarding the small tips and tricks that he was giving. Now, you see, over the years, we have realized that the key to achieving success 
in close red uh, close reducing uh, unstable or difficult or displaced type 3 fractures is you need to have perfect control over the proximal fragment and you need to be able to manipulate the distal fragment okay just try to understand what i am saying there are only two things you need to first is have good control over proximal fragment so he showed you all the techniques where you put k wire in the proximal fragment rotate it and do other things so that you get control over the proximal fragment the second was you should be able to maneuver the distal fragment either by putting transolecanon on pin or joystick method or suction cannula or something or the other so all these modifications for distal fracture have been because we don't have control over the proximal fragment adequately and we are not able to manipulate the distal fragment effect either because of swelling or because of positioning or because of lack of experience multiple facts not the nature of the fracture the combination okay so these are the things that one must be aware of when you try to do a close reduction because with the armboard technique which i have been talking for about 15 20 years now we haven't really faced any of these problems hardly ever we have had to do any open reduction i have not done in 15 years even one open reduction unless it was a compound fracture all fractures if you strap to the arm board the proximal fragment becomes absolutely rigidly immobilized and against which you can do whatever manipulation you want to do with the distal fragment and fix it effectively so i'll just run through the slide the aim of any treatment of supracondylar is to get a good close reduction to have a good ease of wire fixation without struggling about how i am putting the third to get a true lateral okay all the conflict is because you are rotating the arm to see your lateral and your fixation or your reduction is not stable to be able to assess stability post fixation you have to check whether you are able to move it confirm that both fragments are moving together and whether it is safe for the <clears throat> Sorry for interrupting, sir. Your voice is not audible, sir. You're not audible, sir. Am I audible now? Right now, yes, sir. So that's what I'm saying. There is some issue with the audio. Sometimes this will happen. Um, not audible again. Am I audible now? Yes, sir. I I think you can read what is written. Sure, sir. Okay. so when you do your conventional way trying to do a supracondylar reduction hello hello yes sir uh, yes sir your uh, yes sir your voice is clear it's clear no okay so when yes. you do conventional way people do it with elbow on a table right commonly you have hand table so you put the elbow on the hand table and there is difficulty with manipulating it because <clears throat> the hand table is too big for the child's elbow you know it is too long second some people try to put the elbow on the cm tube itself but whatever cleaning solutions you are using they can damage equipment the lateral view may be difficult to obtain because of uh, sorry in the some people have done supracondylar reduction in lateral position if you do it in the lateral position then orienting yourself to varus valgus can be a challenge and you need an assistant to you touch right counter touch and when you try the lateral view and you rotate the arm the reduction slip yeah this is the common so how do you make your preparation the arrangement the monitor should be in front of you the trolley should be by your left side and your elbow should be off the table. so this is what we use this sandwich arm board that people use board like this for a particular stand your leg and then they do a folded sheet of towel so that they have some access around the elbow to pass their but when you see this table keeps on coming in your way it hits your abdomen groin <clears throat> as a surgeon and is quite quite irritating and holding the reduction and rotating the arm for lateral becomes quite common right 
So what do I do and what do I propagate? And I hope a lot of you will shift. It's very difficult to get people to shift to what they are already doing. So this is the position that I'm trying to show you. This is the arm board which you can make in any kind of uh, carpenter for you. Bring the proximal fragment to the edge of the arm board. Yeah, bring it to the edge of the arm board. The distal fragment is off. After that, you put a white sticky tape and snap the proximal fragment firmly to the arm. So the problem of contact action is gone. You already have. Hello. Can you mute yourself? Whoever is there? Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir. Please continue, sir. Yeah, I think you muted me. <clears throat> okay. So, what I was trying to tell you is that after the strapping is done, then the next thing is to have the C-arm position. Yeah? So, when you have the arm strap, your C-arm is like this. For the AP view, orthogonal. Raise the table. You need to have a table which can be raised a little high and turn the C-arm around. So, you have a dead lateral orthogonal view. You are not moving the proximal fragment at all. Anywhere. Okay, there is no risk of loss of reduction or symmetry of reduction after your video. And do your trial reduction first. First, you are doing your trial reduction, getting the alignment, taking it on the CR. So you look at then you do your traction, the coronal alignment, and then the flexion, and then check on the CR. You see that it is in good coronal alignment. Then you see the lateral, dead lateral field is after rotating the C arm not rotating the arm because the arm is fixed. Okay, and there is no assistance, there is no counter traction required. And now you can see the entire elbow is available to you all around for ease of pinning. Okay, can you see that? So that is yes. the pin, pin being passed from lateral side. Two pins, one fossa pin, one lateral uh, uh, column pin, and then you can do rotation. If you want to do leverage, sometimes you may need to use leverage. So you can still pass a T handle K wire and manipulate the fragment into position while you are doing your uh, supracondylar pinning. So it is not as if the arm board restricts you in any which ways. As long as you are able to manipulate the distal fragment effect. That you can do only when proximal fragment is completely immobilized. You don't need to do any rotation, any translation because proximal fragment is secure. It is fixed against which you are able to manipulate the distal fragment and lever it with K wires as needed. And with that, you will always get a decent reduction, right? And that is just to show you. A video showing that reduction and then we can do a little oblique oblique because the tape can be loosened and you can do the oblique views and see the columns yeah and see that they are stable so this is using this method i think chintan doshi went to do his fellowship in singapore so he convinced james that we should be doing this and they 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 use the modification they got a small board like this made and they strapped it in the similar way, okay? And then they did uh, the pinning in the same kind of a fashion, AP and lateral view, okay? And this is what we have published now. This is available for you on my YouTube channel, on Ortho TV, on POSNA. POSNA has it in their uh, POSNA Academy video uh, uh, recordings as a technique. And you can see that I'll just play the video for you and you'll see all the steps again. <laughs> So we went through all this. I'll just skip it for to save some time. Yeah. 
Yeah. So this this is this is the So thank you, any questions? So, uh, no sir, we have no questions in the chat box. So, Maulin Bhai, I think this is a very useful technique. I think everybody should do yeah. because it takes care of a lot of issues. See, I have been earlier uh, criticized by colleagues, seniors that, Aray, ye kya hai? Ye sterile nahi hai. Painting karo, dripping karo. Okay, we are doing painting, dripping is adequate for thin passage okay and now yeah. if you go back and see new literature there are more and more people talking about semi sterile technique for close reduction and spinning of supracondyle you'll find enough literature so in 15 to 20 years zero percent as as far as i'm concerned the close fracture we haven't open reduced and right. uh, second is if there has been negligible infection I can't remember the last time anybody had So don't like, worry that it is not sterile and you need to scrub it like you are doing a total hip replacement. No, no, that's right. Yeah, my so question people is get, yeah, 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 sorry, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, my question is like, uh, typically when we do, you know, when we see the ulno humeral view in an AP plane, once the reduction is done, we like to see the medial and lateral pillar by turning the arm internally and externally by 10 to 15 degrees. How would you see this in the uh, arm boat technique? Yeah, so my question my question is, are you talking about before pins are passed or after pins are passed? 
no no before pin pass because we want to see the both the pillars no, no. are well aligned yeah so that when if when you see ap and lateral you can still the cm 45 degrees if you want okay see yeah, the so cm is in your yeah. control you are not changing the yeah, proximal yeah. or proximal angle once you lock it in flexion you can maneuver the cm anywhere on this angle No yeah, so you can move your CM and you can see the yeah. lateral and medial pillar. Yeah, correct. Okay. What what I am saying is what the arm board is doing for you is absolute immobilization of proximal fragment, offering counter traction. Distal fragment okay. you manipulate the way you want. CM manipulate the way you want to see obliques, AP, lateral. Don't move the shoulder to get the lateral. And have right. clear space all around for passage. In and doing everything. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so okay. all these other, if you see, if you think about all the other methods, okay, the mm-hmm. rotational and other things, all this is because of the control system. Mm-hmm. So you are putting a wire, derotating, putting it down, control section. Somebody is pulling, somebody is pushing. You are using cannula, like a uh, Viraj technique. You are putting a cannula on front and pushing the fragment back. Everything is taken care of if you just snap it down. Another question, Sandeep Bhai. Yeah. Is like <clears throat> once you have fixed, now you have removed the tape. Do yeah. you check in internal rotation uh, the yeah, lateral yeah. view? Yeah. Once. Yeah. Once my yeah. fixation is done, I check section again rotation all directly. And when I do that, I have to remember what is possible and what is not, not what is perfect. Right. Okay, so everybody should be aware of what are the. You don't need a uh, radiometrical system which is hundred percent perfect. If your columns are on top of each other, your hand alignment is in valgus, and your pin hold is good, you will always have a good result. Even conservative yeah. treatment people who are doing have good result. Even bone setter has good. Result. So, We are just sophisticated I mean, bone setters. Yeah, that's right. What uh, what is the incidence that you have to add add a medial pin after yes, doing yes. two lateral pins? No. Good question. So after that, when I do the rotational check with the tape on, or if I find medial combination, or if I find a medial oblique fracture, or if there is a high supracondyle that are deficient, in these situations, sometimes a medial pin is mandatory. It is not remaining stable at all. Sometimes yeah. we have an intra-articular third fragment also, like a medial condylar fragment. You you must have seen. Nowadays, yeah, we yeah. have very high velocity trauma and supracondylar. All are not very classical fragments. Right. So the indications for medial thinning are the same: medial oblique fracture, or medial combination, or unstable after lateral pins, or then right. a additional combinatorial fragment which you are not able to trap your lateral wire. So then you may have to use a small. So when you do the medial pin, what? Okay. I have to take the other of my thumb and push it. Then put the tail with my in front of my thumb. So right. if I hit the other now, I am going to hit my thumb first. So I will obviously not injure myself. And then I will walk in the medial epicondyle with my hand and then attach the drill. Right. And then push that pin from anteromedial to posterior line. Now, Sandeep, I my question is again: that most of the fractures, when we fix it in neutral and in we see in external rotation, they are fine. In the internal rotation, there is some spike, a minimal spike of proximal. So, how much of that is acceptable? And when we should think that this is really unstable, you fix it. So, no. can If you guide they, on that? So, my I'll tell you my my view. The the rotational mal alignment does not cause clinical problem to the patient because shoulder has tremendous rotation. So don't worry right. about mal alignment as in mal alignment. Question is because of that mal rotation, is the reduction unstable because column is not sitting on the other column. Right. If if on rotation there is minimal material fixation is stable and it's not moving both pieces are moving together. You don't have to worry. If okay. the re- reduction is unstable, then you can redo it till you get good purchase. Yeah, got it. Yeah. 
Yeah, go there. Any other questions for Dr. Okay. Patwala? Yes, sir. One question we have from Professor Anand Kishore, sir. Um, I just want to know if there is any place for Dorgan method of medial pin placement, he says. So, uh, Dorgan pin was again described to avoid the ulnar nerve when you are passing a pin from distal to proximal. So, they said you pass it from proximal to distal. But 95% patient, at least in my practice, don't need a medial pin. 5 to 10% may need. If you do the medial pin with elbow extended after lateral pinning, it is quite safe. I haven't had a problem of passing a medial pin just because I had to pass it. And uh, to avoid the ulnar now, you don't need to go from proximal to distal if you do it safely. And third point is, in the attempt to do that the organ pin, you don't under, uh, realize that the trajectory of that uh, a wire is such that you might hit the radial nerve as it comes from the lateral septum. So to save the ulna now, I don't want to hit the radial nerve and cause another palace. So I think it's theoretically described. Practically, I don't think any of us use it. Yes, sir. So one more question. Uh, from Dr. Murdith Shah, what is the opinion of seniors on T-type supracondylar humerus fractures in peri-adolescent age? So you mean Sandeep Vaitra? He asked for senior opinion. Yeah. <laughs> bolo, bolo, sir. <laughs> nahin, nahin, nahin. See, pre-adolescent age group, T-Y supracondylar fracture treated like an adult. Don't do transolecran on ostomy, but a heavy patient, 15-year-old, 14-year-old with a TY elbow, I do by column plating using simple uh, recon plate. And uh, you, there is no need to do olecran on osteotomy because you can definitely get a reduction in time with the rotation. As pediatric orthopedic surgeon, we are much better at using TYRs to get good reduction, indirect reduction. Adults need to see it. I don't know why they want to see it. But uh, they will cut the olecranon and do it. So my only advice is don't cut the olecranon. With a paratriceps approach, align the pillars like we do. We say no pillar reduction is important. Align the pillars. Intra-articular part, you can do arthrogram. You can do k assisted reduction. But get it right and put plates. In adolescent, it is better to put plates rather than using multiple k or accepting a malware. Sandeep, your comment? <laughs> Yeah, for peri-adolescent, peri I agree. You know, plating is a better option, especially if it is 13, 14. Uh, we do occasionally get TY in the younger age group, around say 9, 10 or so. Uh, in which case, they can be again treated close with a, a you know a close KY pinning. In that, the first step would be putting a transverse wire and converting that you know that TY fragment into a single fragment, and then the fracture can be treated like a supraparietal fracture. So that would be my approach in the Slightly younger patient when it's about 9, 10 years old, but uh, older, more <laughs> closer to skeletal maturity where the growth plates are under, already fusing, I think plating is the better option, allows early mobilization. Yes, sir. So we have no more questions now, sir. It's 9 o'clock. So thank you so much, sir, for simplifying the reduction techniques in supracondylar fracture humerus. Thank you, sir. So the next session will be on 30th the next Saturday and it will be on uh, radial neck fracture management. Thank you so much for joining today. Okay, thank you. Thank so you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep Bhai and uh, Sandeep Vaidya. I thank always you. enjoy your talk and I'm sure, Sandeep, my next case I'm going to do with an arm board. Yeah, yeah. Time to feedback. change. Yeah. <laughs> ah, wo hi Rajasthan ka... <laughs> वो ऐसा है बीजेपी कांग्रेस बीजेपी कांग्रेस करना पड़ेगा कुछ ऐसा लगता है लाइफ में कुछ सबका विकास सबका विकास ओके हां हां इलेक्शन टाइम भी कर सकते हो एक बार करोगे तो फिर नहीं छोड़ोगे या या दैट्स राइट वी हैव टू ट्राई इट एंड वी कैन डू इट या एंड यू गेट दिस स्मॉल होल शीट मेड from these, not TM, that is a local company who made the paper ka ye na, disposable drapes. Uh -huh. I made a small drapes. Oh, drapes. So, I put it on the hand and put it on the hand. Once you yeah. have done the earlier reduction, na, you know that you can reduce this. Yes, yes, yes. And then, uh, or, oh. you prepare only that much part. That's good enough. There's no right, issue. Right. Yes. Uh, Mandara Agashya doesn't like this. He keeps on telling me, Are draping tari kara. 
अरे कब We do very limited painting or uh, draping. No, अभी हम बोलता था कोई सुनता नहीं था अभी 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 ने बोला दो तीन पेपर आ गया तो सब सुनेगा दो आदमी का पेपर आया यू रिलाई ऑन योर कलीग्स योर इंडियन कलीग्स बिकॉज वी हैव ह्यूज नंबर ऑफ पेशेंट द प्रॉब्लम विद इज वी We always feel that कि ये numbers are exaggerated, statistics में लफड़ा होएगा ऐसा नहीं है We have to accept. The moment it is getting published in JBJS, वो सब accept करने को लगता है ऐसा नहीं करना चाहिए हम्म आईटीओ और आईटीओ लोगों को आह right so अभी we we missed your uh, uh, your presence in Ahmedabad हमारा clinic पे maybe अरे यार next time we, या या नेक्स्ट टाइम ओके ठीक है चलो बाय 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 बाय